Okay, so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about how to respond to a situation like the COVID-19 crisis and how it affects Agile teams and how they work together. And I'm joined today by John Prell and Sanjay Nelson, two developers here at Gaslight who've had the opportunity to work on a team that is kind of in the, in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. And today we're gonna to talk about some of the obstacles that we faced working in this situation and how companies um, have adapted and see what kind of things we can learn about agile process and uh, see if there's any lessons for you know our normal project work. So today we're going to talk about the process changes that we've seen, you know, how well our process stood up to the ch challenges of the crisis, uh, what kinds of compromises we had to make or adaptations we had to put in place, talk a little bit about the technical side of that, and we'll also talk about the culture and the team impact that we saw working in the middle of this situation. So both of them are working for working on a project for a client that's in the food retail space and um, we won't go into any specifics there but we'll we'll talk about our experiences and what we've learned and we're going to start today by talking first about you know the agile process that was in place before the crisis and how well that served us heading into it so would you guys share a little bit about you know our the existing agile work process when you like how quickly did you see the work come from the, the COVID-19 crisis? Was it something that came up like very quickly or was there a buildup over time? What did you guys see? How was that, how did that come in? Definitely hit pretty quickly once a uh, number of states began to issue stay at home orders and a lot of customers um, began moving to uh, online. So we, we quickly hit a lot of work that we hadn't seen, but sorry. They hadn't seen um, before that was, or there's a, a lot of different uh, kind of uh, changes in priorities. Um, all the while, there was a number of other shifts and changes kind of going on that was uh, agnostic to the COVID work. So it, it was certainly a little bit of uh, trying to juggle and understand what was the new top priority, so to speak. Okay, so from a timeline perspective, some of the states start talking about stay at home orders or things like that. Was that really when the business saw the first change, when you guys saw the first change in terms of the work that was coming in, directly related to those announcements? Yes, yeah, there was okay. a lot of work, uh, concern about um, wanting to put a lot of focus on performance, uh, ensuring that our systems didn't fall over, uh, as we saw an uh, increased amount of traffic. So there was kind of a, a little bit of, uh, you put down a couple uh, pairs and people had to put down some work, uh, which we typically don't like to do. Um, we like to see things through at the end, but we had to put down some work and pick up some new top priority work as there was certainly a, um, concerns over the potential impact. A lot, of the, uh, a lot of it was kind of unknown at the time too, but we're trying to be very proactive and reactive with uh, some of the things that we're Okay, so you have, you have like normal work priorities and then this work comes and you kind of have to put it to the side. Is that, does that mm -hmm. happen in some cases? Yes. Okay. So did this work, did it come through like your typical scrum planning process or was it, you know, more ad hoc than that? Did it follow like the normal work stream and prioritization or did it just feel like, oh man, we have to move, you know, process gets thrown out the window and we just have to move forward on this as quickly as possible. There's definitely a, definitely a little bit of coming from different kind of pipelines. We already are on a team with a few different product managers that we kind of have to balance things from, as well as some technical managers um, and uh, just a few different parties involved there. So I think there's definitely um, a, a bit of like a learning curve of trying to take different priorities from different people during this process. But um, just given the nature of the crisis situation, it was just something we all had to be a little bit empathetic for as far as, you know, new COVID work streams coming. Um, was this, so you guys put some of this work on pause. Did you allocate like all of your capacity to the work or was it like, we'll do 75%? Was that an intentional split or is it just kind of like the, everything else gets 
put to the side and we just have to go forward on this. So as I kind of mentioned before, we were in the midst of uh, some other process changes uh, shortly before this with regards to how to allocate uh, different pairs and, and different developers uh, towards different priorities and work streams within our organization. So it, it was a little bit of kind of figuring out what that looks like in this uh, kind of new reality. Um, well, of course, kind of met, uh, understanding what those priorities were. So there, there was some opportunity in the very beginning where some of the uh, work streams uh, didn't have uh, a lot of work or a lot of high priority work. So it was easy to, to kind of allocate those developers towards this new, uh, towards kind of COVID related work uh, in the very beginning. But as they be began to over time shift to be kind of more and more COVID related work or more or some of the work that we might have been looking at thinking that it might be quick stories that kind of turn into maybe a little bit longer stories, we had to kind of shift and, and juggle exactly what those priorities were, which um, some of the priorities were coming from some different areas. Typically, we, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the work filters through our uh, product managers, product owners, and we had some work um, that was coming directly just from engineering management, especially some of the more technical concerns. So trying to make sure that we had all the right people in the room at the time to best understand exactly what was needed, what was a true priority, and where it kind of fell in line with that. It was certainly a struggle in the beginning, um, but or as it, as it kind of got worse over time. But in the beginning, it was, it was a little easy to allocate, I'd say, some people. But after about the first week, we really had to kind of slow down and, and make sure we had all the right people in the room. Yeah, I would definitely say as, as weeks have gone on, it's become more of a thing where there's been um, it seemed like people higher up above other than us in engineering management have really started getting more involved with how they're specific, um, like the different PMs, their different ownership of the site and the various clusters there. The, a lot of the COVID work has started to flow through those involvements and kind of get organized and broken up that way, which I think does help us with alignment to have everyone kind of involved in strategizing on that before it actually becomes stories on our board. So I imagine a situation like this, you know, that in a crisis situation, there's going to be more of a drive to get like senior management and senior leadership involved in some of the, the work decisions. Is that true? Or was it, you know, was it kind of like, a, the, you know, closer to the, the ground level of we have to fix this, we have to fix that, or was there a lot of direction from you know, senior leadership? I would say, um, I'd be curious to hear what John had to say about this too, but I would definitely say it feels like a, a mix of both. I feel like we've seen um, some stories, especially early on, uh, there, there are various performance tweaks we wanted to make early on to guarantee that the systems um, and architecture um, could just kind of adhere and hold uh, increased traffic, which we pretty quickly started seeing happening. Um, it seems like there's a lot of very senior leadership involved and concerned with this. Um, at the same time, there's there's been like an influx of just various different things coming in where we kind of didn't really even feel like we had the time to ask who who's this coming from. And it was it was more so a concern of does everyone know that we're doing this right now because it needs to happen. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of it's it's kind of been a both and. And, and some of those things were not just like the technical product, but also the impact on like the physical store operations, right? So for example, like someone ordering too much of a certain product or having to put like limits on how it impacted the availability of products in the store. Uh, what were some other like impacts that, you know, beyond just the technical the system, the website, what were the implications of the work that you were doing that you were helping to address? Most of my, I guess, and there's definitely examples of that. I haven't worked on that work, so it's hard for me to say specifically. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I have a great answer on the specifics of, specifics of that as well. I've kind of okay. been just pressured to like stay in our lane and keep maintaining the, the pieces that we're already owning. Yeah, that makes sense. There, at least, the, I guess you could probably categorize the COVID related work that we've been doing. It's almost kind of two separate buckets. Uh, like very general buckets, one being like very technical performance related work, uh, which is a lot of what I've been doing lately. Um, okay. And then there has been other work that, and a lot of that comes from like the engineering management side, 
um, a lot of our service uh, part uh, team partners that we rely on. Um, and then there is, yeah, kind of the COVID related work that's a bit, quite a bit more customer facing. Um, mm -hmm. That's mostly coming from the product management side, such as, yeah, displaying uh, like certain restrictions on products, um, like max quantity type, type of things that uh, we didn't necessarily have the support for before and want to make sure that we, we were able to get that online as, as fast as possible uh, to, to help create a better customer experience overall because um, a lot of the current solutions, it, it, it wasn't always the best. Um, either certain things that they were trying to do just simply wasn't there to support. So it kind of created a poor customer experience in the end um, since it wasn't there. Okay, so that makes sense. There's It sounds like there's two different buckets, generally speaking of the work. One of them is technical work for site performance, things to handle increased load, you know, availability, uptime, stuff like that. And that comes primarily from engineering management, which makes sense, right? Since they're supporting the technical infrastructure. And then from the business side, coming through the PMs, there was a lot of things relating to customer experience and how that, you know, the physical stores impacted during this time, whether it's things like max quantity or people trying to, you know, purchase a certain item that might be in short supply. Okay, that makes sense. Tell me a little bit about how this impacts the culture of the team, right? You've talked through the workload that was heavy, how it, your process sounds like it was not thrown out the window completely, but you've definitely had to modify it. Like this took higher priority. How does that stuff impact the team as a whole? So and maybe you can talk about like the organization, software development organization. Do you feel like there was a, a tangible culture change during this time? And I guess we should also mention that we went from, you know, primarily a physical office environment to a virtual office. And maybe you're, mm -hmm. since you're changing the two things at once, both of those are a factor. Could you, could you tell that there was like, you know, how much it was remote impact going to a remote uh, organization versus a, like the, the culture that, change as a result of the crisis or was it too hard to tell the difference between the two yeah i mean it's definitely felt a bit lumped into a um kind of just this big this big just culture change shift happening from working remote suddenly um and just the increased pressure and kind of like diversified uh amount of ways that we can be getting work put on our plate um I think I think one tangible thing that we've noticed pretty pretty early on is um, we uh, as a team we like to have our developers pair together, um, and that's something that we've really just had to make the hard decision to set aside for now to kind of handle just a very high amount of um, hopefully a short term but a, a high uh, amount of things that we just need to get done. We've uh, had most of our developers um, just start kind of like working solo, so that's made an interesting effect on the culture for sure. Just one week we're in the office sitting next to each other, often pairing together. And the next week we're all not only remote, but not, not as often communicating with each other in like a physical means. Um, but, uh, we, you know, we're, we're doing what we have to do to just keep handling the different work streams there. So pairing dropped off pretty significantly. Right. Um, and if you had to attribute that to, like the priorities and the workload versus the office environment, you'd say it's more like 50, 50 or more a result of the office environment more than the, the priorities. Um, I would definitely say the latter the priorities um, have for, okay. for our team specifically been what's caused us to have to make that decision. And again, we, we only think it's going to be temporary given just a lot of different things to juggle right now, but that's definitely been the case right now. What are some other like, development practices how have they been affected so you mentioned pair programming what about things like you know our our qa process or the way that we like work through environments like dev test stage qa have the disciplines around those things held up as well or have they been impacted by the crisis i'd say they've held up Pretty well. Um, not to say there haven't been problems, but I would say that any problems that we've had, we've always we've had before. So, um, okay, we have a pretty robust QA process um, that I think has continually improved and gotten better. Um, it has been a little, quite a bit challenging, but I think a lot of us have stepped up to stepped in to help out our, our QA 
um, as needed. The uh, and I haven't seen there, there's been a few hiccups here and there, but I haven't seen any 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 major permanent changes, so to speak. Um, we are moving to, uh, forwards with I think we're trying to do uh, more continuous uh, deployments than we ever have before, um, which is interesting. I don't know if that would have happened any sooner, uh, despite everything, but it's it's pretty exciting to see some of the changes that are still coming down the pipe despite everything that's going on. But I, th I think overall, a lot of that's gonna help us uh, even as we continue to adjust and try to adapt to the ever-changing environment that we're in right now, so. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, like agile software loan practices and by extension, some of like the, the modern CI, CD practices, they are designed specifically for this kind of situation, right? They're almost designed for quick changes, a lot of agility, and the ability to you know, modify systems on an ongoing basis. So it's, it's pretty cool to hear that overall they've held up because this should really be the proving ground of lots of changes to a system, you know, allows us to keep quality high and ship things to production more quickly. Do you, have you seen any impact to like things like the defect rate? Um, you know, are you try? are you, is your code containing more bugs or less bugs? And has any of that changed at all? I definitely, um, I would, I would honestly say, I, I feel like we haven't seen an increase of defects. Um, I mean, we've had like a few issues come up here and there, but it, it seems to be about the same rate as it was in our previous working conditions. Um, yeah. Um, and, and kind of an aside to that is we've actually gotten a few uh, different story opportunities that um, just due to the new priorities and nature of a lot of COVID work, um, we've actually gotten to go back and kind of address some different either bugs or issues that were just prioritized much lower previously in different areas of the site. So it's a, it hasn't all been bad. There's been um, some like opportunities as far as like bug fixes and optimizations to just tackle some things that just, you know, delivered a, exponentially higher value given the current circumstance. And so we've been happy to get those things done. In the past year, we've definitely been striving to at least maintain kind of one swim lane of addressing technical debt and trying to keep that down um, and known bugs. So it's, it's, it's been a little, there's, there's times where some of the work that we've played recently, especially for uh, performance reasons, were stories that we've known about for a long time. So it's a little distressing that we didn't get to address that, but it is, it is kind of nice to be able to get those things fixed now, and it certainly lends credence to the to the argument to be made that you have to be careful when you know uh, deprioritizing something that may seem small now. It may come back to to potentially hurt you later. So thankfully, nothing has um, come back to back truly hurt us, but uh, it has been good to knock those things out. Some some organizations they don't do a good job of you know, keeping technical debt low. And in a situation like this, imagine if the system was, you know, the cost to add a feature or modify a feature was exponentially higher than it is now. This is the sort of situation where a company can really regret the choices they've made in the past, right? And obviously no, no code base is perfect and there's always technical debt that you wish you could have eliminated previously. But these are the kinds of scenarios that you imagine you know, an organization that's not prepared for rapid change, uh, really, really regretting, you know, how they allow technical debt to accumulate. So if you, to hear that there, there's actually time now that because we're kind of going in and doing some performance improvements across the site or making some changes, and we're able to get some quick wins and removing technical debt now is shows that, you know, there's a good foundation, at least for the technical practices that um, allow for high quality development and, and fast development. So let's talk a little bit more about, you know, your, you sounds like you maintain most of your testing practices, your QA and your you know, development environment, um, deployment, some things like that. What about the connection to your work? You know, we oftentimes as, as software developers, we, the work that we do mostly is, you know, consists of code and obviously like our teammates, but sometimes the physical effects of our work is not very, isn't something we see a lot. And I imagine this kind of scenario 
it could exacerbate that, but it also might provide an opportunity to think more about how it's impacting people, users and employees who are using our systems. Have you guys felt like a little closer to your work during any of this? Maybe like, you know, going to the store or whatever it is. Do you feel like you get closer to your work as a result of this? I definitely um, have felt a little bit of that just lately, um, you know, working for the, the online ordering and delivery and all that platform of like an e-commerce website and central business during this time. Um, it definitely, uh, it feels extra valuable to be able to like, just do whatever we can to help, you know, people get, you know, the, the stuff that they need without having to risk themselves being, you know, around too many people in person. So I've, I've definitely felt a little bit of like a, a spike of, yeah, I'm doing some really meaningful stuff and, you know, that feels good especially given just the increased stress of this time um, work-wise and just in general, it's, it's, it's good to remind myself that, Hey, even if this is an extra stressful work time, it's, it's also a very meaningful thing that I'm doing right now. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's uh, I, we use, you know, we use the, uh, the site, um, but it's, it's reading about, uh, about it more in the news and then having more friends and family. Yeah. Use the, uh, products that I'm writing code for um, is pretty cool. And it, it certainly kind of, yeah, it brings me closer into what I'm doing every single day. What about the retail workers? Since there's, you know, employees, other team members that are actually kind of in the, the uh, operational implementation side of this, do you ever, you get a better sense of what life is like for them? Or is that still like pretty obscured to you? I would honestly say it definitely feels pretty obscured to me still. Okay. Yeah, I, I used to work retail, so I, I kind of have a little bit of a yeah past experience from it. But um, yeah, it definitely um, yeah feels still a little bit obscure, at least through the, through the work, other other than what I read on the news or yeah, see kind of see hear about every day. Yeah, because there I mean there is we have to remember it's it's easy to think sometimes in the age of Amazon Prime and stuff like that, like there's actual people that are still doing real work and all of us who are fortunate to be able to stay in our houses and keep our jobs, you know, for the people that, that um, you know, are working in these retail environments, like they still have to go to the physical workplace and are in that space for eight plus hours a day that we're trying to avoid. And that's a pretty, you know, they're, they're sacrificing a lot to do that. And so for building software that helps make that job better, easier for them, uh, I imagine that's also, you know, a, a cool feeling, but also recognizing we have, we're in very different positions. So we're fortunate in the software development world to be able to do that. It sounds like there's been some improvement just in terms of like feeling the value or the, the, the worth of the work that you're doing is improved and you feel a little more, more connected to you know, the actual, um, the product in a sense, but there's, that still takes a toll on our team too. And being these kinds of situations is hard. And we've already talked about like the remote work and the uh, kind of like heightened focus on the priorities. How has that impacted your, the team's health overall? And if it's been challenging, like what are some things that you would recommend to other teams that are going through a situation like this? on how to like things to watch out for and areas for like improvement um, and how we can protect ourselves and our team from, you know, burnout and things like that. Yeah, I think it's, it's been interesting to talk to people on our team and, and other people in our, our company um, about how they feel about it. I don't know some people just absolutely hate it and some people really enjoy it. So it, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to hear those perspectives. Um, I would say in general, overall, it's very, it's important to try to be a little more proactive about maintaining communication, especially face-to-face -face communication, um, whether it's just like an after work, uh, zoom call to play games or, or have a happy hour at home, happy hour. Um, but even just daily, like daily meetings. So even something as small that could potentially just be a text conversation, it's still nice to have that 
verbal communication, which could also help kind of alleviate mis miscommunication, but more importantly, just to have that social human connection um, on top of, uh, yeah, instead of just being kind of feeling disconnected. And at least for me individually, definitely maintaining a day-to-day a -day similar routine has helped. Um, just having like a treating every day is about be going into the office, waking up at a normal time, going to sleep at a normal time, taking lunch at a normal time, um, and just trying to keep it, yeah, as, as routine as possible, as if I was still at the gas head office today. Yeah, we definitely uh, kind of just flew through those first few weeks. Um, and we, I, I knew just from talking to various people on the team, we've always had a pretty like close team. We all actually like each other and all that. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we were all just kind of feeling the lack of being able to actually talk to each other and not just about work stuff, but like over lunch, go to lunch together, things like that. Um, lately, we've been a little bit more intentional, like John said, about having, you know, maybe like a happy hour after work one night on like Zoom or just various things like that to kind of keep in touch. We've uh, optimized our like chat servers to kind of organize things better for work and non-work communication. Um, so just kind of making those adjustments and also just understanding that, yeah, like, again, like John said, everyone's kind of taking this differently. So trying to approach things with a bit of empathy and support um, is just, you know, it's, it's a tricky situation, but I, I think we're doing a pretty good job about figuring it out. Yeah, we've tried to do some of those things at, for the company as a whole, mm -hmm. trying to find ways to connect, even though it's, it's not the same for sure. Um, I think there, one thing that's been kind of interesting is we actually get a, a peek inside, you know, our own homes and our living situations being on Zoom all the time. And you can see my, you know, my third floor grandma bedroom wallpaper behind me here in my home office. Uh, John's cat was interrupting the call earlier. So I think there's, even if we're losing some of that in-person work side of the relationships, there's some if you if you have a family or you know if you have kids at home or pets, you get more time there, which is kind of an interesting trade off. Um, assuming you don't go crazy in the short term, but yeah, it's kind of it's interesting as an experiment. Not sure it's I'm ready for it to be like the new permanent reality, but it's been interesting over the last couple of weeks. I was definitely cool. reflecting on that early on. Uh, when, yeah, we had our company on Zoom and most people had their cameras on. It was just really. Uh, cool to see all that you know the work that we do and and you know the the opportunity that gaslight like, gives I mean you know everything you know people's homes and you know their their life and situation is kind of made possible through what we do and what uh, you know we do together and what gaslight like, provides so it's just yeah it's been really cool to see just yeah that that impact that you're not gonna see just in an office so that was that was really cool first couple of days cool well thanks guys for joining us today to talk a little bit about this situation and thanks for sharing your thoughts about you know what agile looks like in the covid crisis especially for a team that's you know in the middle of of the, the line of fire i guess from you know what people in our economy need you know there's a obviously default to like spending money and time and the things that are most critical for your life and and food is a big part of that so Thanks for sharing and